Okay, let's open a word of prayer, Lord. Thank you for this day. Pray that you'll bless our time together today. <coughs> Pray that you'll always give us uh, wisdom and understanding uh, of the times in which we live. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today I'm going to talk about making choices. Again, just a reminder, this is a little grid that I use as I look through Bible prophecy-related events. Uh, that things are accelerating, they're converging, there's also logistics. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later today. And then understanding that last one comes from this passage in Daniel that talks about at the time of the end, the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Then many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. So we should always be striving to be one of these wise people. But then again, I think there's a tendency sometimes to um, call it too quickly, I guess. I, it, it was interesting, I, as you know, we're going through an election in the United States, and I say that because a lot of people listen from uh, different countries. Everybody's going through elections this year, it seems. At least 40, 50% of the world will be elect, have major national elections this year. It's going to be a very disruptive year in that regard. Uh, but as things are heating up here in the United States, I get these emails, videos, all these things. So, and so this week, everything ranged from the fact that uh, Trump, excuse me, Trump is the uh, uh, essentially the Messiah. Trump is okay. Biden is great. Uh, Trump is the Antichrist. Uh, Obama is the Antichrist. And uh, what happens, I think, is people make a, reach a conclusion. And then everything, uh, as I've said many times before, people turn their conclusion into a hammer and then everything in the world becomes a nail for them to pound on with that hammer. And they look at events through their conclusion rather than looking at events and facts and seeing whether they, because everything supports their conclusion. And I think that's a, an issue that we need to deal with as we do need to deal with, um, you know, these things that are uh, coming about. You know, we know that there's going to be these four horsemen, uh, there's a lot of argument about these. My view, uh, which of course I think is the correct view, of course, is that the horses, the seals open, the horses ride, and the effect of that horse, like the white horse or red horse or green, pale horse and the uh, black horse, the, um, and I, didn't, I don't think I got those in the right order, but as they, they, their effect spreads out over this whole last period of time, it increases over time. Now it may peak, some may peak a little bit earlier. Some people have the view that seal one opens, everything with seal one happens, and then seal two, then seal three, then seal three, then seal four. Uh, but the problem is like one view, which I don't agree with, is that at seal four, one quarter of the world dies. I don't think that's what uh, Revelation 6 says, it's more talking about, I believe, the scope of the authority that that horseman has over one-fourth of the earth. Authority all the way up to killing them and executing them, but I don't think it says that he actually does execute them. But some people try to compress that into a six-month or one-month period, but then if, so if it's one-fourth of, one of the earth and a eight billion population right now, that's two billion people, so just divide it by day and hour and minute, and it's a, it's a killing like we've never seen before. Now, it's possible, I just don't think that that's what the passage is saying. And then we also have these judgments coming and the, uh, uh, the trumpets and the bulls. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about, um, well, I'm gonna talk a little bit about AI at first. So there was an interesting article in CNBC earlier this week that said, Magnificent Seven Prophets now exceed almost every country in the world. Should we be worried? So what they found is that there are seven uh, big companies now in tech, and those companies are... Um, 
uh, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, Meta, Alphabet is Google, Meta, Microsoft, NVIDIA, and Tesla. In a research note, Tuesday, Deutsche Bank analysts highlighted that the Magnificent Seven's combined market cap alone would make it the second largest country stock exchange in the world. Uh, the largest being the New York Stock Exchange. However, this level of concentration allows some analysts to voice concerns over risk in the U.S. and global stock markets. And that is something that is concern. And I've got to go here to my uh, slide deck because I meant to move these to the other place, which I never do. Um, so here's the... Um, so here's what's happened with NVIDIA. Uh, I believe that a $10,000 investment in NVIDIA year, uh, when it first came on, it was a gaming company. That's what most of its revenue came from was graphics for gamers. And they did a great job. But then uh, Jason Wang, the, um, the uh a CEO of NVIDIA and the founder, he stayed with the company all along. He saw that this AI thing was going to be very important. He started developing chips that are used in these AI large language models. Uh, most of them are made in Taiwan, mainly because Taiwan has the ability to get the, uh, the technology to etch the silicon chips at these micron, very, very small uh, levels. And they've, they've pretty much reached the physical limitations on those, although they keep adjusting them. And so what NVIDIA did was, uh, and by the way, these machines that they have in Taiwan, they're starting to install them here in the United States in some of the Intel plants. Uh, I, and the equipment is huge. I mean, it's... Uh, they're, it's very large. I know that I saw an article in the Columbus Dispatch recently about the Intel plant that they're building out in New Albany, and they're talking about when they bring this equipment in, it's going to completely disrupt and shut down freeways and highways all over the south, east, east, and northeast sides of town. And some of these, my understanding is some of the trucks and trailers to bring these might be like 165 or 200 feet long. Uh, it's, uh, and you're, <laughs> I see a, a truck driver here this morning. That's a, <coughs> that's a very difficult thing to drive. Uh, and you have bridges and electrical lines and all these things. So it's, these are huge machines. They're mainly centered in Taiwan right now, but with NVIDIA, they've developed a chip. It's about the size of an iPad. holds up iPad, and um, the NVIDIA website says that these chips have at least, at least 200 billion transistors per chip. Now that's an incredible number, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around, but then what they do is they take these chips and they, excuse me, I need to shut that one thing down. So they take these chips and they put them in an array of like 255 chips and the, the calculations that it can make are phenomenal. We talked a little bit about this. Uh, we did, I was able to arrange a round table for um, a few of my friends, uh, Tom Hughes, Scott Townsend and Britt Gillette. We did that Thursday night. You can find that on our web, on our YouTube channel, on our Rumble channel at Real FBC. I believe Britt Gillette has also posted it on his YouTube channel, End Times Bible Prophecy with Britt Gillette. And those, um, those um, we had a, a very interesting discussion about that. Tom, it's just so you know how it was organized, Tom uh, Hughes wanted to moderate it, and so he moderated it so that the three of us could engage in the discussion. So we hope to do more of those. I'm going to be doing an interview this week or a chat this week with Pablo from Serpents and Doves and Patrick Wood from Technocracy News. I think that's on Thursday. And I'll also do a Q&A 
or discussion with Tom Hughes uh, most weeks, and I'm sure it'll be this week, on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 p.m., 10 a.m. Pacific. So anyway, so the, NVIDIA has developed these chips and the market has just gone crazy. NVIDIA this week, at least for a time, passed $2 trillion in market evaluation, joining only Microsoft and Apple that have reached that stratospheric level. This gives these tech companies an incredible amount of power. And what's happening is that just the rise in NVIDIA on the market's up right now, and NVIDIA accounts for about 20%, 27% of the run-up in the market. So it gives a lot of power to these companies, and a lot of it's driven by AI, and everybody's going crazy with AI right now. Now, it could be a bubble. Here's the Financial Times uh, saying NVIDIA profit bonanza drives a global rally as stock markets ride the AI wave. And you can see here on the left how the NVIDIA share price is done. It reached a low in the middle of 2022, and now it's uh, so it's about 100. Now it's eight, close to 800. It's, you know, if, if you have NVIDIA in your portfolio, that's good. Um, and this is sort of how they break down. So their revenue is up uh, in just a quarter to $22 billion uh, from a negative revenue <coughs> last year as they were developing some chips and everything. So, and you can see now that data far outstrips gaming and NVIDIA's um, development. AI also has had some Google has this thing called Gemini, which is image generation, but it's not doing that well. They've decided to uh, halt it for a while because it's been programmed to be woke, I guess. And, and Google, so here, here's this, they said, give us a picture of a German soldier in World War II, and this is what came up. And then it said, give us a picture of the founding fathers of the United States. And they were not, there were no white guys, I guess is the best way to say it. Um, and like it or not, most of them were white guys. So uh, here's what in the Financial Times article says, companies use a process called fine tuning to reduce errors in generative models that often relies on human reviewers who deem whether the AI's responses are inaccurate or offensive. Google said its goal was not to specify an ideal demographic breakdown of images, but to maximize diversity, but then it became historically inaccurate, so Google's had to shut it down and they're gonna to have to go back to fine tune it. Uh, Jeffrey Hinton gave a speech this week at the University of Oxford in the UK, and uh, this led to an editorial uh, piece in Friday's uh, Financial Times about how fatalistic should we be on AI. Now, you remember Hinton, he worked for Google. I think he's about 76. He retired last year as AI was developing, and he gave some very well-known interviews, I think one on 60 Minutes, and, I, and a couple of others, I played clips of them, and he was very concerned about where AI, AI is going, and he remains very concerned. Here's a little bit of what he said at the University of Oxford. These things we want to get control so that they could do things better. So they're going to have the sub goal of getting more power, so they're more effective at achieving things that are beneficial for us. As soon as they get any sense of self-preservation, then you'll get evolution occurring. The ones with more sense of self-preservation will win, and the more aggressive ones will win. And then you'll get all the problems that jumped-up chimpanzees like us have, which is we evolved in small tribes, and there's lots of aggression and competition with other tribes. That is the threat that these things could wipe out humanity. And so that's uh, his opinion, and so the Financial Times editorial was, should we be fatalistic like Hinton? Some people, like the person at Meta, is optimistic, but then you see this ridiculous nature of what's going on with um, Gemini, Google's Gemini. And the the problem is that um, there's no rate, there's really no effective regulation. And the problem is 
more so that there's probably not going to be any effective rev regulation because these things are going to be out there spread across the world. Some companies are saying, we'll just open it up to everybody. Other people say, no, 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 you can't do that because bad people might take advantage of it. Imagine that. So it's when you look at it in terms of Revelation 13 and the technology that's coming, that it, it seems that Revelation 13, which talks about a mark to buy or sell, and if you don't have it, you won't be able to buy or sell. So it seems like it's controlled at the point of sale. That's why I'm not so sure I believe that it's a cashless society. Well, largely, it's already largely cashless society. You know what happens when you go to a store and you pull out cash. You know, the young person, usually young person behind the uh, cash register is like, okay, now what do I do with this? And, and if you give them like, if it's a $6 item and you give them $11 so you get one bill back, they they really kind of get confused, like, well, you, sh you shouldn't have given me this one. Uh, and I just did this yesterday, uh, just to verify that I've, I'm not seeing things. But this technology, this controlling technology, it seems like there has to be controlling technology. So I'm going to talk a good bit about that with uh, Patrick Wood uh, this week, so I'll probably stop talking now. There's also some other issues with this concern about the environment. Uh, so for here, example is Europe has all of its wind farms are aging. And the technology has improved substantially that these turbines can put out much more power than they used to. So it says here they could do about 800 kilowatts. Now they can do 7,000 kilowatts, but they're as tall as the third tallest building in the UK. I've seen pictures of these things being hauled off to the trash heap. And what do you do with these things when they stop working? They're not really, you, just, you can't upgrade them. You have to just tear them down and put something else up in its place. Uh, I'll talk, I'll, I'll talk more about this at the end because the, this is something that I've been talking about for years, and now it seems like everybody else is talking about it finally. And I always like it when people eventually agree with me. So uh, NVIDIA is moving forward. So now I'm going to focus mostly on Middle East, Israel, global security, talk a little bit about the war uh, between Ukraine and Russia and how that's going. But so here's the first thing, and, and I want you to keep in mind the sort of operative uh, idea that blessing Israel is a good thing. And those who curse Israel are going to have problems. And so you're, I think you're going to see as countries try to push Israel to make peace in the Middle East and to divide up their land, it's not going to go well for them. You're going to see a lot of disruption politically, economically, socially in those countries that do this. One example of that was this week. So Prince William, the crown prince in the UK, came out and he said, look, I, uh, here's what he said, like, I, like so many others, want to see the end to the fighting as soon as possible, talking about Israel and Gaza. There is a desperate need for increased humanitarian support to Gaza. It's critical that aid gets in and the hostages are released. Now, this is very, very naive on his part. He had an opportunity to make a good statement, but I, it's probably, you know, it's probably his education, his upbringing, that led him to this, because what is the one thing that nobody ever says in this discussion? How about Hamas unconditionally surrender and give up its arms? Nobody ever says that. So here is Prince William looking, in my view, silly in the way that he approaches this. There is a desperate need for increased humanitarian support in Gaza. It's critical that aid gets in and the hostages are released. 
Sometimes it is only when faced with the sheer scale of human suffering that the importance of permanent peace is brought home. Even in the darkest hour, we must not succumb to the counsel of despair. I continue to cling to the hope that a brighter future can be found, and I refuse to give up on that. And we'll talk a little bit about this as we go forward. So here's what happened in the UK. Here is uh, projected on Big Ben is this slogan, from the river to the sea, to the sea, Palestine will be free. And somebody was able to project that on Big Ben. And there's been protests all over the place. Um, the police are not sure what we can do about this. It doesn't seem to fit. It's causing problems in the, in the UK that people now, they've given bodyguards to three female members of parliament. They haven't said who they are. I can guess on a couple of them, although they say they're from both sides of the, uh, pers of the uh, political spectrum, and a plot to target parliament. People are concerned there was a big dust up in parliament this week. They had a debate on Gaza, and there's a question like, should we have an immediate vote to require Israel to or to tell Israel that we need to, you know, they need to settle this, they need to make peace. But this, this phrase, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, ignores this fact. I'm just going to read this tweet. I thought this was a good tweet. The reason people say from river to the sea is because they believe the entire land is Arab land. The reason they believe the entire land is Arab, and it's because they don't know that even throughout all the thousand years of caliphate colonialism, the land was still split between Jewish and Arab minority, majority areas. The reason they do not know that there have always been Jewish majority areas alongside Arab majority areas is because they don't know that the land was once entirely Jewish majority land as the indigenous population before Christian and Islamic conquests. Uh, and others, bringing in various other, often transient, transient populations. The reason they don't know any of that, despite this factual and well-documented information being available for the last five months, much less the last five decades, is because, well, they are anti-Semitic. Calling for the entire land to exist as an exclusively Arab ethnostate under Islamic rule, when the demography of the land was never, in all of history, existed as such in these um, ethnically diverse regions can be categorized by nothing other than ultra-nationalistic supremacy and virulent hatred of Jewry. And I think she's exactly right. This is a big problem. And you're seeing it come, come to the forefront everywhere, even in the Christian community. And I personally am very troubled by this. So the fact that um, Parliament in the UK has this debate about what they're going to do in bringing, uh, requiring Israel to reach a ceasefire agreement. And it's easy to vote for that when it's not your people who are being held hostage and it's not your soldiers who are there fighting. This is what happened in the UK this week. Nuclear missile test misfires again. And they had a Trident, uh, Missile, it misfired, and I think it's the second time this happened. So this is an editorial cartoon, which I thought sort of captured a lot of the major problems with the UK's defense right now, is that the, what's misfiring is their political system because of their way they're treating Israel and making Israel enter into this ridiculous agreement. And these, these people are just totally clueless. So I, I don't know, I think that's a very good editorial cartoon, putting the Big Ben as a, um, as a missile. So a little bit more in the Middle East. So now what we have is we have this massive tunnel system in Gaza, and they're in the process of destroying it, but it's, it's massive, it's huge. On the left is a graphic that the IDF prepared about two months ago almost, 
in late November, early December, so I guess that would be more than two months ago, three months ago, and the red area, the red lines, this is what they would reveal at the time. Those reveal the tunnel systems that they've found and that they will reveal to the public. They now estimate that you know, when the war started, it was about 300 kilometers, which is about 180 miles of tunnels. Now they're saying it's above 500 miles. And these things are everywhere. Here's a graphic that the IDF put together to show the uh, tunnel system under Al Shifa Hospital in Gaza. And you can see that, and this is what they did. They embedded or put these tunnels and the entrances under hospitals and other places that have supposedly a humanitarian purpose. And so here was a tunnel under this particular hospital. <coughs> and nobody ever seems to want to talk about this. So you can see that how this tunnel complex looks as it's put underground sometimes 60 to 150 feet underground. And how do, you, how do you deal with this? You know, do you flood them all? Some people say, well, just build a tunnel and from the ocean then uh, you know, leave a plug in there and pull the plug and let the ocean fill it in. That's a possibility. Uh, and I don't know that you can even destroy everything. Uh, but a lot of these have explosives in them, and when you see they blow up, some of these are secondary explosions, which indicate that there are explos explosives and missiles, missile manufacturing facilities there that need to be blown up. So here is um, a development. Now, last week I talked about the fact that everybody was saying there was a Munich Security Conference. I'll play a couple clips from that in just a moment about Israel needs to make peace. They need to resolve this in Gaza. They need to enter into an immediate ceasefire. Israel, for its, to its credit, is considering these proposals, but they've not been, uh, they're, not, they're not going to give in. They're, they're, they're still going to go forward. So here's the New York Times from the other day with Netanyahu offers a plan for life in post-war Gaza. Now, Netanyahu has spoke on this quite a bit, but he's not issued a specific plan. There's been a lot of um, disagreement, conflict within the emergency government that they set up. They brought in Gantz and Eisenkot as an as a advisor, uh, sort of to broaden the coalition that's governing Israel right now. But they don't, they don't necessarily get along. They, there's a lot of personal animosity. So, um, and so this is the way that it's uh, presented. New York Times headline, Israel outlines a post-war plan. Palestinians call it occupation. Financial Times, um, yesterday, Netanyahu defies U.S. with Gaza vision. Well, what's he supposed to do? So here is a copy of the, of the report that Netanyahu put together, and I'm going to go through it. I'm just going to read essentially what it says. The IDF will continue the war until its goals are achieved. And those goals are the destruction of the military capabilities and governmental infrastructure of Hamas and Islamic Jihad, the return of the abducted, and the prevention of a threat from the Gaza Strip. Those seem like laudable goals given what happened on October 7th. And by the way, I, don't have, I didn't have time to download it and go through it, uh, but there was a, a report issued by a group in Israel that has gone through and examined these rape allegations. The people who oppose Israel, oh, there's no proof of any rape or any mutilation or anything like that. And go listen to the bodies, of, or the, the, bodies the ex testimony of these medical examiners. There's plenty of interviews of them out there. Caroline Glick's done one that I think got over a million views. Um, Jeremy Gimpel, who you remember spoke here many years ago, his sister-in-law had just started doing preparing bodies for burial, which is a very important thing uh, to Jews, to Judaism. They want to respect the body. And she was talking about just the horrible things that they had to deal with, burnt bodies, mutilated, parts chopped off, shot in the genitals, and that type of thing. 
And so in that context, what Netanyahu is proposing seems to be pretty reasonable. They need to have security guarantees because of what happened on October 7th. And by the way, if I forget to mention it later, what's one thing you're not hearing very much about in the press recently? For days, weeks, and months, we got these daily reports of how many people had been killed in Gaza. Remember? So many women, mostly women and children. And they never broke out who were the Hamas fighters. And Israel says, you know, look, we've gotten about 10,000 10, or more Hamas fighters. But now all of a sudden you're not getting death tolls every day. At least I'm not, I read a lot of newspapers. I'm not seeing them. And what's happened is people are analyzing the statistics. And what they're finding is that in, despite the claims that this is a genocide, and I would say, if this is a genocide, and Israel's been committing genocide against the, quote, Palestinian Arabs, they're the worst people, the worst genocider, genocidal maniacs in history. Because the Palestinian population has grown from a few hundred thousand in um, 1948, and and they say a lot of people left after the 1948 War of Independence. So all those people left, and the population is still now around probably five and a half or six million Arabs within Israel, including the areas that we, they call the West Bank, I call Judea and Samaria, that's the proper biblical name for them, historical name. So if Israel's committing genocide, they're not very good at it. And what they're finding is in this war, the ratio of civilian to military terrorist death is maybe the best ratio of any war in history. It's about a maybe less than two to one ratio. In most wars, the UN own, own report, I think I showed a part of it a couple weeks ago, they say that in most conflicts, it's nine civilians killed for every one military. Here in this one, it's probably under two and a half to one, maybe under two to one. When the US went into Afghanistan and Iraq, the ratio is about five to one. And so here, here you have probably this military and one of the most difficult military environments devised ever this incredibly dense, densely populated, heavily armed, tiered network, deeply embedded with these tunnels, hundreds of miles of tunnels, unlike any other terror base in the world. So it's the largest, most sophisticated terror base in the world. The fact is that they're actually doing a pretty good job in terms of not causing a lot of civilian deaths. So I noticed over the last week that people are just not talking about that that much because military historians uh, like Roberts from the UK who spoke in Parliament, I think in the, in the Lord of, uh, House of Lords, said this is unprecedented really in human history, the ratio of civilian to military deaths. So nobody gives them credit for that. So that's what you're not seeing. So here's what Netanyahu also says in his plan, security. Israel will maintain operational freedom of action in the entire Gaza Strip without a time limit for the purpose of preventing the renewal of terrorism and thwarting threats from Gaza. Sounds reasonable given what happened on October 7th. Number two, the security zone established in the Gaza Strip in the territory bordering Israel will exist as long as it exists in which there is a security. Now, part of this is the translation from Hebrew to English, but you get the point. We're going we're gonna to do this as long as we need to. Uh, number three, Israel will maintain a southern closure on the Gaza-Egypt border for the purpose of preventing the reintensification of terrorist elements in the Gaza Strip. The southern barrier will operate as much as possible in cooperation with Egypt and the assistance of the U.S. and will be based on measures to prevent smuggling from Egypt both underground and above ground 
including at the Rafa crossing. Now, they're in the Rafa region, they're getting ready to do an offensive in the Rafa region, and so there's all this concern, are they gonna do this before Ramadan starts? Are they gonna do this? Would they actually do this during a Muslim holy day? And the answer is, the attack from Hamas occurred on a Jewish holy day, some Chat Torah. So did anybody ask the Islamic countries in the world, the people of the Islamic faith, hey, why did you attack Israel on a, a Jewish holy day? They did it 50 years ago on Yom Kippur. They did it at the end of that uh, period of time of, of holy days this, this past fall. So this issue, and I'll show you a picture in a moment of the southern border, which <laughs> this is a secure southern border, <coughs> supposedly, but all of this stuff is getting into Gaza through that border. For Israel will have security control over all the territory west of Jordan, including the envelope of Gaza, onshore naval air spectrum, to prevent the strengthening of terrorist elements in Yosh and the Gaza Strip, and to thwart threats from them towards Israel. So we're going we're gonna to have security control over everything west of the Jordan to the Mediterranean. That makes sense, given what's happening, and given the powder keg in the West Bank. There will be a complete demilitarization of, in the Gaza Strip of any military capacity beyond what is required for the needs of maintaining public order. The responsibility for realizing this goal and overseeing its existence in the foreseeable future is given to Israel. So that's on the security side. Now there's a civil side to what Netanyahu proposes, number one. As much as possible, the civil administration and responsibility for public order in the Gaza Strip will be based on local officials with administrative experience. These local entities will not be identified with countries or entities that support terrorism and will not receive payment from them. What's that to do? Well, for a long time, the Palestinian Authority has engaged in a program taking money from US taxpayers and other countries that fund the Palestinian Authority, and they're doing what is called pay for slay. The people who have committed terrorist acts in Israel and are in prison, their families get a monthly stipend. In many cases, much higher than they could earn at any job working in the area of the West Bank, meaning Judea and Samaria. That's parts of which are supposedly under Palestinian control. Point number two on the civil side, a comprehensive de-radicalization plan will be promoted and all religious, educational, and welfare institutions in the Gaza Strip as much as possible with the involvement and system of, assistance of Arab countries that have experience in promoting de-radicalization in their territory. I think this is a direct reference to what the Saudis have been able to do under uh, the authority, the operational authority of Mohammed bin Salman. Although he's not the king yet, he has led a plan to de-radicalize Saudi society. A lot of these radical Wahhabi institutions have been banned or banished. They still thrive in places like Qatar, where they fund these radical Muslim Brotherhood organizations. So, and, and here's Qatar being the, the go-between. So here's the basic rules for future settlement in the long term. Uh, one, Israel outright rejects international dictates regarding a permanent settlement with the Palestinians. Such an arrangement will be only reached, will be reached only through direct negotiations between the parties without preconditions. Number two, Israel will continue to oppose the unilateral recognition of a Palestinian state. Such recognition in the wake of the October 7th massacre would give a huge reward to the unprecedented terrorism and prevent any future settlement. Three, Israel will work to shut down UNRWA, whose operatives were involved in the massacre on October 7th and whose schools taught terrorism and the destruction of Israel. Israel will work in UNRWA's activities in the Gaza Strip and replace it with responsible international aid agencies. That's long, 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 long overdue. Should have never been allowed to happen the way that it did. Um, you can go to uh, Palestinian Media Watch, Itamar Marcus organization, 
uh, uh, palwatch.org, I believe is their website. And you can read about a lot. They, they track what's in, in, in Palestinian media. And I, I use the term Palestinian media because that's what everybody calls it. So not because I agree that they are a distinct group. Because uh, look, <laughs> you want to get in, you want to win the argument with somebody, just ask me, okay, so give me a history of all the great achievements of Palestine in history. Like who were the rulers? Who are their legislators, that type of thing. And they don't have an answer because it just doesn't exist. They can't pull it out of thin air. So UNRWA, so Palwatch does that. And then there's also a, a Scandinavian group. I think it's from Sweden. It's called Impact-SE. Go read what they, they pull out the Palestinian textbooks. And they show, you know, examples. The math examples are like, okay, you have... Uh, five Jews and you kill three and you maim the other two. You know, I mean, that's that's the way the math programs work. I'm, and I'm not exaggerating. I mean, they're really that bad. Uh, so number four, the restoration of the strip will be possible only after the complete completion of demobilization and the beginning of the deradicalization process. The rehabilitation plan will be financed and led by countries acceptable to Egypt. So Israel's going to maintain control of this. And look, you can criticize the Israeli government because they let this thing get out of control because everybody thought, we've got this under control. We, we're, we're working with them. Hamas seems to have changed into a peaceful organization. And how did that go? Now, here's a picture of the Egyptian border with, on the southern border with Gaza. That doesn't look like, um, some people say, why don't we have a southern border like this if we're having such a problem there? The answer is, I don't know. Egypt did it, and, and Egypt's strengthening their border as we speak. Because they have a problem. They don't want this Muslim Brotherhood-infused population to come into Egypt. Now, there is some clearing of land. They think that that might be for a refugee camp if Israel goes into Rafah. But Israel has plans to take the population that moves south to avoid the fighting in the north and the central part of Gaza. There's some indication that Israel's ready to set up refugee camps away from the area of the fighting. It's a very difficult logistical thing. It's going to take time. But the, the biggest part of this is you're going to have to completely re-educate the public. That's going to take, assuming uh, the Lord doesn't intervene, that's going to take a couple of generations at least to do that. And we all know that. So here's UN, U.S. and uh, Palestinian Authority immediately pushed back at the day after plan that Netanyahu presented. Uh, the U.S. also came in and vetoed. There was a ceasefire resolution that was introduced at the UN. The US vetoed that at the Security Council, although there are reports that the US is going to introduce some kind of its own proposal. Uh, and so this is uh, from a Jordanian Al Qaeda uh, newspaper in Jordan about you know, the, what the veto is, how the veto operates. And it, you know, it's, it shows how they, that's Jordan, that's moderate Jordan doing that. There was also a terror attack <coughs> um, in the West Bank, Judea, Samaria, at a traffic jam. There's also this report that a UN worker's body, or a UN worker, dragged an Israeli's body from October 7th through Gaza. And that I've seen videos of them dragging women and others that have been killed, just dragging them through the streets. Um, and the crowds all gathered around cheering. So you talk about, it, you know, is Palestinians innocent? By most estimates, in Gaza and in the West Bank, close to 80% of the people, even in the West Bank areas that are under Palestinian authority control within Israel, the west of the Jordan, 80% approve of what Hamas did. About 80%. It's, it's amazing. So here's an article about this uh, traffic jam. This uh, a lady was killed at this, and it was just outside of Jerusalem. 
at an area that they call a settlement. It was a traffic jam, and so they attacked the traffic jam, and they killed someone. Um, this is the other thing that was a big deal this week. Uh, during the administration of Trump, uh, Pompeo instituted, as Secretary of State, a thing called the Pompeo Doctrine, which said settlements in the area of the West Bank. So this map here, this on the right, that's... That's a UN map. That's what's called the West Bank. Jerusalem is in that little white part that kind of goes in there. And so this shows uh, the different areas of control. So that sort of light blue, purple color, that's area uh, <coughs> C under Israeli control. Area A, the orange areas, think is area A, that's Palestinian authority control, and then the white areas are, are sort of tan, light tan, based. I don't even know what to call these things. Um, that's why I was glad in school that art was a pass fail or a complete or incomplete instead of a grade. But um, so the, um, the lighter areas, let's put it that way, those are uh, there's a joint control that's exercised there. And Netanyahu says, listen, we're going to have, it's going to be purple all the way to the Mediterranean from the Jordan River. We're not going to put up with this anymore. And there's a big problem in the West, in the West Bank. Um, Biden has a bit of a political quandary. Uh, there's an uh, election on Tuesday in Michigan they have a very large Muslim population, particularly in the Detroit area. I have a congresswoman who's Palestinian-American, she says, Rashida Tlaib. And they're trying to get people to vote uncommitted uh, when the primary runs because nobody's running against Biden. So here's Blinken speaking, I believe he's in Buenos Aires, speaking the other day of, just yesterday or Friday, about the overturning of the uh, Pompeo Doctrine, that the settlements, Jews actually living in historical Judea and Samaria within Israel, between the Jordan and the Mediterranean, that those aren't illegal under international law. This is what Blinken had to say. On settlements, uh, we've seen the reports and... Um, I have to say we're disappointed in the announcement. Uh, it's been long-standing U.S. policy under Republican and Democratic administrations alike that new settlements are counterproductive to reaching an enduring peace. Uh, they're also inconsistent with international law. Uh, our administration maintains a firm opposition to settlement expansion. And in our judgment, this only weakens, doesn't strengthen Israel's security. And uh, David Friedman, who was the uh, U.S. ambassador to Israel, said this, Blinken is 100% wrong. I researched this for, and by the way, Friedman was a superb, a big law firm attorney in New York. Uh, never had anything against him, but I did against his law firm. Uh, Blinken is 100% wrong. I researched this for over a year with many State Department lawyers, there is nothing illegal about Jews living in their biblical homeland. Indeed, under Secretary of State Eugene Rostow, also the dean of Yale Law School, who negotiated uh, UN Security Council Resolution 242, stated that Israel has the best legal claim to Judea and Samaria. For Blinken to announce this in the middle of a war and when the Jewish Sabbath has already begun in Israel is unconscionable. And here's another tweet from someone who talks about the fact that, listen, the Mount of Olives has been a Jewish cemetery for over 3,000 years. And it's a huge cemetery if you've ever been there. The whole thing is covered by, with graves. And so this denial that Israel had any right to the land is just absolute insanity. So here's a little bit of a, a close-up Oh, the other thing, the other narrative that's happening is that the settlers are out of control in 
Judea and Samaria. And you know, they're attacking people. We've enacted sanctions against a number of uh, settlers. And so the uh, Israel Hyom, and you can see this is very complicated. So you can see how the, the situation is in the area of Jerusalem there on the left. It's, it's a very, very complex situation. But here's an article in Israel Hyom, I think today. And this is, this is what the article says. Now, this is a translation from the Hebrew, so forgive it if it's a little bit awkward in its language. It says here, the police in Shin Bet say this. They do not know the Israelis that the U.S. and Britain punished, according to an Israel Hyom investigation of the seven residents of Yosh, on whom sanctions were imposed, only one is known to the authorities in Israel. So, well, where is the U.S. getting this? Well, they're getting it from these pro-Hamas websites. There's some uninformed stooge in the State Department who's feeding this to the Biden administration, or the Biden administration is saying, go find us something so we can do this, so it looks like we're even-handed in this whole thing. And they're not even-handed. Um, moreover, the Americans and the British did not conduct any preliminary investigation in Israel because they would have learned that about a, and they keep saying, well, the settler violence is just out of control. It's growing like crazy. But Israel Iom reports is that it's dropped 50% in Israel since the beginning of the war. A senior police official said this, according to the data, there was an incident, um, there was a clash between settlers and Palestinians in Yosh in August 2023. The Americans and British did not hold any preliminary inspection or consultation procedures with the police in Shin Bet, even though they had extensive ties with Israel's security systems in a wide variety of fields. This is what Israel Iom says is facts, not stories. Data received by Israel Iom shows that even in the fourth year of the war, there was a drop of almost 50%, I think that's in the fourth month of the war, there was a drop of 50% uh, in incidents defined as extreme violence in Judea and Syria. It's made up. But this permeates everything. Here's European Foreign Minister uh, Joseph Burrell speaking at the Munich Security Conference a week ago today about what Israel needs to do. The agenda is being shaped by events. And the most important events today are related to three geographical issues, which, is, which are Ukraine, Gaza, and the Global South, and a functional issue, a structural issue, which is defense. First, we have to continue supporting Ukraine military and economically more and quicker. Second, we have to increase and provide Ukraine with uh, security commitments. The most important security commitment for Ukraine is membership. The third one is to prepare ourselves for a long period of tensions with Russia. We have a Russian problem ahead of us, and for that our military effort has to be sustained in cooperation with uh, key partners like the U.S., but we have to consider different scenarios about how much engaged will the U.S. be on the European security. On the Middle East, we need to promote a political solution, a comprehensive one, which includes not only Gaza, but also the West Bank. We strongly call to Israel to avoid military actions against a highly then uh, populated area at is Rafa. The West Bank is, uh, is boiling. We could be on the eve of a greater explosion. The question is, is there a political space for Europe to support a two-state solution? If we want to play a geopolitical role on this issue, we have to be more united, as we have been in the case of Ukraine. We have to have the U.S. Well, it's interesting. The context of his remarks, he says, Israel cannot win this war by military means. Really? How do you know that? <laughs> that seems to be really the only option at this point. 
for decades, at least 30 years since Oslo was enacted or entered into at the White House in September of 1993, everybody's tried this land for peace thing. It hasn't worked. In fact, the situation has gotten worse and worse and worse and in part because leadership in Israel bought into it, and they should have never bought into it. And it's easy for me to say because I'm not there governing it. So here is the Palestinian prime minister speaking at the Munich Security Conference, and I think he's asked some tough questions, but he does the political thing, and it appears he doesn't answer them. Listen to this. Israel, for its part, says that it wants to avoid another October 7th, while Hamas has slaughtered some 1,200 people on, on October 7th. Um, there's evidence of sexual violence, rape, mutilation. I mean, do you really think that they would stop until they feel that the threat is over, that they've regained some sort the of sense of security? The history of Palestine did not start on October 7. The Palestinian sufferings started in 1948. And this cycle Let's of violence... Let's talk about the now. We, we, we know the history. There's you two see, different versions of it. Let's see. talk about the now and if what happens going forward. You are asking about now, yes? My duty is to make it clear to the audience so that the people understand the macro picture, not only the little tiny micros. Even though the situation in October 7 has been disaster, catastrophic for everybody, and don't, we don't accept the fact that civilians have been killed. This is something that we totally don't accept. So you see what he says is no civilians were killed because they're all military in Israel to them. Even the little children who are still held hostage, at least we believe are still held hostage, they're military because they're occupiers. So how do you, how do you reason with somebody like this? This is a man who's trapped in his own intellectual inconsistency and dishonesty. He cannot reason through the problem. And there weren't Palestinians in 1948. There were Arabs in 1948. They really never became known as Palestinian Authority or Palestinian Liberation Organization until the KGB and Russian Soviet Union made that up to cause a lot of problems. So that's, and, and that's going to continue. Um, so the concern now is, you know, so for example, here's Hebron in the southern area of Judea, a uh, very important place, the tomb of Machpelah I've talked about many, many times. Uh, if you ever go to Israel, you should try to go there. It's also up in Hebron itself is um, uh, Mamre. Uh, and by the way, Joel Kramer does an excellent a YouTube video on that. You can go to Expedition Bible and see that to explain the history about it, and which I don't really have time to do today. Joel does a phenomenal job on this one. He does a phenomenal job on virtually all of the ones that he puts up. But you can see how it's H1, H2. It's very complicated. It's very divided. I have to say that having been to Hebron a number of times, it's the most divided place I've ever been in my life in terms of gates, closed roads, open roads, no man's land, restricted roads, that type of thing. Now, if you've got a Israeli license plate, you can pretty much go everywhere, but then you're also marked in times of conflict that, hey, that's an Israeli car, so you're, there are some risks to doing that. So, but it's, it's incredibly divided. I mean, there are areas where there were shops, and after the uh, Jewish guy shot up the, uh, the mosque part of the tomb of Machpelah, uh, the, uh, Machpelah, the tomb of the patriarchs, they closed those down. And then there are places where there's just, you know, the turnstiles and gates and all these things you have to go through to get in and out of old Hebron. Um, it's, it's pretty incredible. But the question is, what are, you know, how do they, how do they manage this? And then there are people that live in uh, Ephrat, just north of Hebron, between Hebron and Bethlehem, Hebron and, um, and Jerusalem. And now the concern, too, is that these tunnel systems, they've actually discovered some small tunnels in this, in, around Hebron. What are they going to do? So everybody's pushing to get this deal, get this deal done. Uh, there's some internal 
dissension within Israeli government right now about whether the ultra-Orthodox, who are now about 17% of the populate, male population in Israel, they're exempt from military service. So a lot of the people across the political spectrum, except people on the far right of Netanyahu's government and Netanyahu, want to have the ultra-Orthodox conscripted. They have to serve in the military. We need the people. And so there's some tension going on right now because Netanyahu opposes it. They continue to have problems with the uh, Houthi attacks in the Red Sea and the, the strait there between Oman and Djibouti uh, and Somalia. They did attack a ship. Now, initial reports were the ship is sunk. Now I'm hearing that it's just leaking oil. But it's a big container ship. It's 750, 800 feet long, so it's not inconsequential. Now, the plan was that they announced at the G20 back in early September that they would put in place this Middle East uh, or this India Middle East European corridor where things would be taken to ports in the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, offloaded onto trucks. The trucks would then drive across. I think I talked a little bit about this last week, but. My concern is that I don't know that that's an answer to the problem because if they're attacking ships, they can attack trucks. I don't. I mean, trucks might move a little more quickly than the ships, but modern technology being as it is. So now I'm going to talk about the north, and then I've got way too much. <laughs> and we, by the way, we have a meeting at, here at church, uh, so that's why uh, I'm doing this early today. So the problem in the north, the Lebanon border, the concern is that, and there's a report, by the way, this morning as I was preparing this, there were attacks at Qajar, uh, Kirat Shmona, uh, Dan. Uh, you can see this is the Qajar there. That's on the Lebanon-Israeli border, been a divided town, but it's about two miles from Tel Dan. And then you see Majel Shams over there, the Druze town in the northern part of Israel in the Golan Heights. And so there were these uh, rocket attacks today. And this is, this is a big problem. So there's a concern, though, that there is a massive tunnel network within uh, southern Lebanon. In fact, this is an article that was posted in Liberation magazine in, uh, this past Monday in France. And it, I'll just summarize it for lack of time. You can find um, there's a great Ynet article that summarizes it. Times of Israel has written about it. But they say that the tunnel network in southern Lebanon may exceed in terms of depth, fortification, and structure, maybe way beyond what they found that Hamas has in Gaza. So Hamas really took over Gaza they had 15 or 16 years to build that network after they took over Gaza about 2007, 2008. And look at what they've been able to do in that period of time. It's, it's stunning. But Hezbollah has been in control in Lebanon for um, 25 years longer. So you can imagine what kind of network they've been able to put together. Now, back in 2021, Alma, I mentioned them a lot, Alma, or... Israel-Alma.org, I believe, is the thing. They did a publication. You can find it and download and read it. Hezbollah's land of tunnels. And what they did was they compared the tunnels in Gaza to how stru the tunnel structure that they found in, in North Korea to South Korea. And what they found is that North Korea is sort of importing their technology on tunnel building into Gaza. In fact, there's this map here of southern Lebanon. There's Sidon up there on the left, and these lines are what they anticipate are the tunnel network in southern Lebanon. This is a massive problem. And so the concern was that they were going to come, so this area, this map inset, which you saw the larger picture of, covers this area here of southern Lebanon. It's a, it's a massive problem. I don't know what the answer is going to do. It's much more extensive than the 
Gaza thing. Times of Israel also wrote about it. In January, early January, they interviewed someone from Alma, and she said, listen, this is a sophisticated tunnel network that's way beyond um, Israel's. So Israel, part of the reason why they were using some bombs early on, uh, here's an article in Israel Hayom that talks about um, that they're working on trying to enter into some kind of agreement. There's, Israel continues, there's a lot of back and forth between Israel and Hezbollah. They killed some Hezbollah members in Syria. Israel seems to do focused attacks. Then Hamas responds. Hamas tries to attack Israeli bases and intelligence gathering places at Mount Meron and elsewhere. And so you have this situation that just seems like it's going to spiral out of control. By the way, there was a meeting of Christian broadcasters this week, and they endorsed a resolution to not call it uh, the West Bank, but to use the terms Judea and Samaria. And that's good. I try to do that. Sometimes I use West Bank because that's what everybody else says. So this is interesting. Foreign Affairs, Council of Foreign Relations, they're globalists, but they do draw sometimes from people uh, across the political spectrum. But they're mostly globalists, foreign policy elitists in the United States. So they have a number of articles in their new, new magazine, Does Peace Have a Chance?, and one of the lead article is by Martin Indyke, who's been involved in all the Democratic administrations forever. And he says, the strange resurrection of the two-state solution, how an unimaginable war could bring about the only imaginable peace. And so to him, the only way to do this is to do a two-state solution. The article says, finally, Biden can influence the public debate in Israel by going over Netanyahu's head. And look, this is consistent with the past two Democratic uh, administrations. They want to get rid of Netanyahu. By the way, some surveys are released by a public policy uh, organization, very extensive research, much higher sampling rate than in almost any other public polling. They found that Netanyahu's support since the beginning of the war has actually gone up. Uh, or it's back to the level that it was at the beginning of the war. So like if they had a head-to-head -head between him and Gantz, uh, at least right now, polling shows Netanyahu getting 47% and Gantz about 34%. Caroline Glick did a program at the JNS YouTube channel this week that talks about that. But listen to what Indyke says in this article. Finally, Biden can influence the public debate in Israel by going over Netanyahu, who said to address the Israeli people. They deeply appreciate that he was there for them in the darkest moments after the October 7th attack. Biden. <laughs> His visit to Israel comforted the country when Netanyahu could not. Ever since, Israelis have watched as the President of the United States has defended them, fought for the return of the Israeli hostages, rushed military supplies to the IDF, and vetoed UN resolutions critical of Israel. By contrast, Netanyahu's standing with the Israeli public was already at a historic low before October 7th, and it's gone even lower, and I just think he doesn't know what he's talking about. And that's pretty indicative of a lot of people in our foreign policy establishment in Washington. They have jobs, they make a lot of money, they get great pensions, they go to private think tanks, and they don't know what they're talking about. Um, here's even in the Financial Times editorial, Israel's don't reward them argument misses a moment of opportunity. And this article says, look, it's the lack of a Palestinian state that's going to do this. It, it doesn't solve anything. It's the existence of Israel that everybody's upset with. Here's another article, the two-state mirage, how to break the cycle of violence in a one-state reality. People don't support it. The red line is Israelis. The uh, blue line is Palestinians. And they don't support a two-state solution. The article then goes on to identify, well, these are the people that are going to help bring us peace in the Middle East. And I have to say that um, that will only happen in a world that is under strong delusion. And we know that that's coming. People are going to think that there's a peace. And then this article, of course, they couldn't go, Israel's self-destruction, Netanyahu, the Palestinians, and the price of neglect. And it's all Netanyahu's part. In Israel's November 22 election, Netanyahu won back power. 
His coalition captured 64 of the Israeli parliament's 120 seats, a landslide by recent standards, but he has people that we really don't like. And then there's this article in um, Israel Hayom talking about the surveys that are going. And this focuses on people aren't really happy with the government, but when you look at other parts of the survey that Caroline Glick looks at, Netanyahu, I think saying that Netanyahu is gone is maybe, um, as I said before that, I, I think it'll be difficult for him to survive. Only 26% of the country want elections right now in Israel. Um, and if they held him right now, I, by the way, uh, the, the parties of Ben Gavir and Shmotrik, which had 10 seats in the, in the Knesset and is a joint list, if they had the elections right now, it looks like they would get 14. And these are the radical right that everybody hits. And so I think as Caroline points out is there seems to have been a shift to the right by everybody in the country because of what's going on. And Caroline has a great article at JNS. You can find that, just uh, go to JNS.org. And she says, Israel's both traumatized and sober minded. And it's a very good analysis that she does talking about the fact that this was traumatic for us on October 7th. We grieve. We are still grieving. Every day we're informed of soldiers that are being killed. But this thing in the global south, it's everywhere. Here is uh, Lula, the new president of Brazil, speaking this week. What is happening in the Gaza Strip and with the Palestinian people has no parallel in other historical moments. In fact, it did exist when Hitler decided to kill the Jews. He's speaking what Israel's doing in Gaza. It is very funny, very funny when I see the rich world announcing that it is stopping contributions. For humanitarian relief for Palestinians. I am left wondering how big the political conscience of those people is. And how big is the heart of solidarity of those people who are not seeing that in the Gaza Strip? There is no war going on. It's a genocide. It's not a war between soldiers and soldiers. It's a war between a highly trained army and women and children. By the way, the prior president, Bolsonaro in Brazil, was very supportive of Israel. But this guy is a leftist backed by, I think, funded by people like you know who, and they're, anybody who questions the results of the election or challenge them, they're being arrested, they're having their passports taken away, and this is, this is how the left operates. It sounds very similar to another country that you may be familiar with, how things went, and so this is, this is Smotrich. So I need to quit because we're running up against time. Um, Putin does, look, it, I think Ukrainians are, they're really hurting. And I think they're not, look, even the Europeans are now saying, we don't think Ukraine's going to win. Is, it, is the U.S. going to support Ukraine? That's up in the air. Um, and here's an editorial from the Times of London. Where's that ammunition from the West? Zelensky driving a tank. Uh, J.D. Vance wrote in the Financial Times, Europe must stand on its own two feet on defense. And the interesting thing is that the EU is taking, seeing what's happening, and the EU is pushing its own defense now. That's kind of interesting. So I want to show you one thing. So. Uh, there was this article about demographics, uh, troubling decline with the global fertility rate. Um, so here's a graphic. This is an example. So this is Ukraine's graphics. And on the right, you can see what they project. So right now, population as of 2023 in Ukraine was about 36 million. I think it's much less. But you see all the way out in 2100, they're projecting 20 million. And part of the reason is because of what's happened in the war. A lot of young men have been killed. Young, dead young men do not produce babies. 
And so if you look over here on the left at the population pyramid, you see that in the 21 to 24, over here, I haven't blown up part of that. In the 21 to 20, 20 to 24 and 25 to 29, they don't have men. And this is the problem, so they're going to decline. By the way, this is Russia's projected population, and it's going to decline quite a bit over time. It's going to go down, I think, to 114, 144 million to around 100 million. Uh, this is China, and you can see how China their population pyramid, they're starting to get way too many old people up here at the top, and it only continues to get worse. And look at how their population declines. Do you see that? And so this is why I think demographics is important. This is Japan, and they're increasingly age, and look at their population decline. So a lot of these countries, I think, are players in the end times, and so the question is, is the Lord going to wait 100 years to come back? I, I don't know. I think that a lot of these countries know they're declining. Iran is also declining in population. Um, look at Italy. A bunch of old people look at its population decline. But then here's Niger or Israel. It goes up. And here's Nigeria. Oh, I thought I had Nigeria. It goes up as well. And it still looks like a traditional pyramid. Um, big deal. And then there are, Iran is supplying all kinds of missiles to Russia. I think that's important, although um, the uh, Iranian ambassador to the UN said, no, 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 we're not doing that. That's just, that's, a, that's propaganda. Uh, they're supplying missiles to Russia. And that has prophetic significance. Well, I got a lot that I could talk about. Well, if I have time, I'll do a midweek update this week, and we'll talk about it next week. So interview with Patrick Wood on Thursday. I think that's at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 p.m. Pacific with Pablo and Patrick Wood. We'll talk about technocracy. Patrick is probably the expert on technocracy. And then check out the roundtable we had the other night if you want to do that. Let's pray and uh, pay attention. There's a lot going on. Uh, I'm just barely scratching the surface. So let's pray. Lord, thanks so much for your word. Thank you for really blessing us with the, um, the blessing us for allowing us to live at this time where we can see things that prophets a couple of millennia ago were talking about that we can see unfold. And we just pray, Lord, that you'll, though that you will help us to be wise in how we deal with this information and that we will use that as a motivation to live holy lives on our own, to armor, put on the whole armor of God, and to share the gospel with those around us. Bless us this week in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.